Hey, I'm Jay Shetty, and I'm the host of On Purpose. In this week's episode, I had the honor to interview President Joe Biden in his first ever personal interview about mental health. We have an enormous opportunity, but the thing I want to change is American attitude. We can do anything. There's nothing we've ever set our mind to we've not been able to do we've done together. For real. Listen to On Purpose with Jay Shetty on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, I'm Wilmer Valderrama, executive producer of the new podcast, De My Abuelita First. Each week, the incredible Vico Ortiz and fabulous abuelita Liliana Montenegro will play matchmaker for a group of hopeful romantics. Right, Vico? You know it. Listen to Dave My Abuelita First, Thursdays on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't do anything I wouldn't do. Just do it better. Besitos. The podcast Transportista, Who Murdered Captain Coral, tells the story of Colombia's drug wars. Pablo Escobar's death was supposed to bring peace to Medellin, but that peace was shattered for Beto Coral when his father was murdered. Two sides, criminals and law enforcement, in a battle to the death, in the middle, a city full of innocent people. The result? Thousands of forgotten victims. Listen to Transportista, Who Murdered Captain Coral, on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, Jody Sweeten. Andrew Barber. Jody Sweeten. Andrea Barber. Uh, that we used to do that all. We would just walk by each other on set it, from Full House, Fuller House. Just the, all, every time I would see, I just walk yeah. by like Andrea Barber. I so don't like know why. Last Monday, yeah. Jody yeah. Sweeten. Yep. <laughs> why just, did we start doing that? Why did we start doing any of this? You know, <laughs> I, I just, have no idea. It just. Because it's one of those things like you pass each other so often, I think, in dressing room hallways. I always felt it was always like awkward to not like acknowledge somebody. So I would just say their name at them in some sort of strange, random fashion. I don't know. <laughs> it felt it, appropriate and it normal. It felt appropriate and normal. Right. Which should have been the first warning. No. Um, <laughs> but yeah. And Ray Barber, I'm so glad to be here with you today. Me too. Me too. You this know what is I was, so fun. I, I was thinking about because we were talking um, last week about going up to the Full House house. Mm hmm. When we were out in front of the house and the house, the house, the house, house, the the house, the house that no longer looks like the house because they don't want people knowing it's the house. Right. Right. That the owner came out when we were out there dancing like fools in front of the house. Right. And we tried to play it off really cool. I don't think I don't think we did. (laughs) I don't think the Um, owner really appreciated that, but that's okay. Look, we were bringing joy and happiness to the sidewalk area in front of the house speaking of bringing joy and happiness um it's amazing how many people do stop by that house um and again really sorry owners Mm -hmm. we didn't do it we apologize we we apologize but there Um, were people there even like they weren't there for us no that's what i'm saying they're not there for us but right but just as a general sorry that you have to live in a in a you know a tourist attraction um but (laughs) There were people that came by to like take pictures of the house, right? Mm-hmm. So of course you and I are standing in front of the house, and in our, and, and are dressed in our nineties grunge, dressed in kind of nineties grunge outfit, which <laughs> looked fabulous, by oh, the way. I um, loved those outfits. Yeah, yeah, loved those outfits. Thank you, Taylor Arrear, stylist, mm-hmm. uh, for pulling that off. Yeah, he nailed um, it. Anyway, there was a family of three girls and a, and an older brother who ran across the street to the point they ran and I was like oh my god a car (laughs) like I was so this kid just took off running towards us right um and three little blonde girls and their older brother and mom who were losing their minds apparently they dressed one of them dressed up as Steph for Halloween I think they did the three I think they were uh, DJ Steph and and Michelle right the three Tanner Um, sisters they were the three Tanner sisters they were so excited they were there on vacation they just stopped by to see the full house house and like, oh they my were from God, like St. Louis, Missouri, or something. Saint, yeah, right? they're from yeah. Missouri. And then we were getting ready to leave, and another family of three came up. Mm-hmm. And I started to say something to them, and the dad turns and he says, "We're from Germany. We don't speak English." Oh, that was a terrible German accent. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to let people know that he did not, in fact, speak English. Um, and they were from Germany, coming to take a picture 
in front of the Full House house and saw us and were like losing their mind. I, I wonder what they were thinking. Like, I can't even put myself in their shoes of how trippy that must have well, been to see the actual I, characters. I actually actual did actors. that once when I was up on the road trip with the girls uh, and my and my friend Brooke, who you know, um, mm-hmm. we were up there touring around, and he was like, "We have to go by the Full House house." I was like, "All right, let's do it." So we drove by because I wanted to get a picture of the kids and I in front of it. And we're standing there getting a picture. And of course, people pull over and they're going to get a picture of the house. No idea. So I offer to take these people's picture. I was like, hey, you want me to take the picture? (laughs) And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay. So I take the picture and I put my glasses up and I hand the phone back to them. And they they were like, (gasps) oh, like it was such a great moment. And they're like, will you get a picture with us? I was like, yeah, absolutely. It was just, it's, it's so much fun to like, I mean, could you imagine showing up to a place for your favorite show and like randomly some of the cast is there? It's so trippy. <laughs> so it was like when we drove around uh, in the car when we were shooting some of the promos for Fuller House and we were all dressed up in our 80s gear. Oh, yeah. Bob we gotta and talk Dave about and John. That was about you five and years Candace. ago. Yeah. We were up there shooting for the 30th anniversary of the premiere of Full House. Mm-hmm. And Jeff Franklin, the creator of an executive producer of Full House, he owned the house at that time. He had actually bought right. it and was trying to renovate it. Yeah. Um, I think he wanted to turn it into a, a B&B or... An Airbnb? I think so. Or just... And I, I, I felt... Okay, here's the story I remember, is that he wanted to make it look as much like the Tanner house inside as right, which is impossible. Show, which because, is totally impossible. Because physics and that and, house couldn't... Ex- Let me tell you, we've been inside that house. Tiny. It's so small, you guys. It's so small. You couldn't... You would have trouble just getting Danny and the three girls in there and not being miserable. But, like, add in the Katsopolis and the Gladstones and the and the babies and this. Oh, my. There... It was... That house... Was, would have been, if it actually existed, um, really, really, really packed tight. Oh, yeah. for sure. It's, it, yeah, small rooms. Real estate is very expensive in San Francisco. It, it is. So it the is. rooms reflect that. That's um, true. So, but not yes. the backyard of Full House, because that thing changed every single episode. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> we'll, we'll discuss that for sure. We'll definitely um, get to that. Speaking of episodes, shall we... Uh, Shall Let's we dive it. in? Let's do it. Let's do this. Welcome back to How Rude Tanneritos. I am one of your hosts, Andrea Barber. And I am one of your other hosts, the only other host, Jody Sweeten. <laughs> Today we are discussing the pilot episode, season one, episode one, titled Our Very First Show. It first aired on September 21st, 1987. And the show goes a little something like this. When Danny Tanner's wife, Pamela, is killed in an auto accident, he finds himself alone to raise his three daughters, DJ, who is 10, Stephanie, who is five, and baby Michelle, who is nine months old. Fortunately, Danny's hair-obsessed rock star brother-in-law, Jesse Cochran, hmm? Hmm. along with Danny's cartoon-loving friend, Joey Gladstone, move in as unlikely help for Danny to raise his girls. This episode was directed by Joel Zwick, who we will talk a lot about later because he is such an iconic 90s sitcom director. Indeed. It was written by Jeff Franklin, who we've also mentioned on the show and will be appearing on the show at some point. He also created the show. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he's the heartbeat of the show. Uh, And this episode is starring John Stamos as Jesse Cochran, (laughs) Bob Saget as Danny Tanner, Dave Coulier as Joey Gladstone, Candace Cameron Bure as DJ Tanner, Jody Sweeten as Stephanie Tanner, Ashley and Mary Kate Olsen as Michelle Tanner. And Kimmy Gibbler has yet to enter the building. Kimmy Gibbler is mentioned in this episode. Mentioned, yes. But has not yet made an appearance. Not yet entered, no. Uh, but there are two other guest stars, uh, Alice Herson as Claire Tanner, Danny's mom, uh, and Christy Claridge as Vanessa. Who- uh, very important fact, by the way, about uh, uh, Christy Claridge, who also, when she appeared at the front door when I watched this episode, I was like, I remember her. I remember really? I loved the out- whatever the outfit she- that she had on, some very 80s, like, bustier pink moment. I was, ve- like, as a kid, I was like, I like that outfit. Oh, but okay. more importantly... Um, she was Miss International 1982, but she is the sister of Linda Hogan, who is the ex-wife of Hulk Hogan. So 
That is such a random fact. I mean, that it doesn't get more '80s than Hulk doesn't. Hogan. Okay. What is it? What you think about that, brother, or whatever? What wasn't that the Hulk Hogan? Sorry. I, sure. I don't know. Let's I'm go not with a, that. I'm yeah. Let's go with that, and let's never do it again. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Um. Let's do it. Let's Here do we it. Go. <laughs> Let's go. Everywhere we look. Everywhere you look. Uh, let's start with the opening credits. Uh, we talked about this in our first episode. Yep. But here the, we the are. The longest opening credits. The longest opening credits yes. ever. And so iconic. Um, we love them so much. Do you, um, Jody? do you remember auditioning for this pilot? Like, were you excited about getting your first pilot? Tell me, like, you were five. Like, how much life experience had you had? I actually didn't audition for the show. Uh, I had done a guest appearance on a show called Valerie, which was Valerie Harper's show. Oh, yeah. Um, which later became the Hogan family. Um, but I had done a guest appearance on that playing the next door neighbor's niece, Pamela okay. Poole. I actually Aww. played Pamela. And um, <laughs> and so um, I did an episode of that with Jason Bateman. And um, that was my first episode of television ever. And then from that, they had sent a tape uh, over to Jeff, I guess, of my appearance on that. And he was like, yep, that's Stephanie. And that was it. So I never actually auditioned for the show. It just, again, this weird little magic spell that's been cast over Full House. Like the people just sort of, if you know. It's it like was kids field of dreams. Yeah, if you if you yeah if you create it, they will they will they will show up. Oh. So um, anyway, so that was that was how it happened. What about? I mean, you'd been doing Days of Our Lives, right? Oh yeah. Well, I I, I was ten, so I had I had extensive acting credits extensive under career. my name huge yeah yeah <laughs> at that point right. Um, so yeah, I do remember bits of my audition. I auditioned twice. I auditioned for DJ first, and then I auditioned. Obviously, didn't get that role, uh, and then I auditioned for Kimmy Gibbler. Um, is this a good time to talk about the script that I found? My original I mean, audition script that before nobody Before we get else into has? the show, I feel like we should definitely bring up what could have been. What could have been, right. What so could I have been, yeah. This, this, I don't know, like, look at me saying this. Let me show you on this audio podcast a, what it, I'm holding well, up a, right now. It's a, well, why don't you describe it? It's a I'll script. <laughs> <laughs> this is an original script, a very, very early draft. Of Not even pilot like an script. original. Pi well, it's an original pilot script, but so original. It's not even the same characters. It's not basically. the same characters. It's dated February 18th, 1987. And um, let me tell you the shocker. Uh, what I why I didn't remember is that the characters have completely different names. So I auditioned not for DJ, but for the role of Jennifer. Yeah, because DJ was originally Jennifer. And Uncle Jesse wasn't Uncle Jesse. He was Uncle Adam. Did you, yep. like, do you remember this? Do you remember? I, weirdly, I do. You do? When okay. I saw that script, I was like, oh my gosh, that's right. But then I'm also like, wait, maybe am I remembering Jeff telling the story that it was Uncle Ad? Like, I, I remember Jeff talking about some of the changes in the names. But I, one thing I do not think that, that we've ever talked about was that the Tanners weren't originally the Tanners. This is mind-blowing. This is mind blowing. This is huge. We were gonna be the, the Crawfords. Crawfords. Like it just it doesn't hit the same way. It doesn't. It doesn't. We no. Stephanie Can you Crawford imagine being the no. Crawfords growing up. No, it's, it's not the same. No. Like this show never would have been a hit if if no you had been the Crawfords instead of no. the Tanners. It was a necessary change. The Tanners made it happen. I agree. Well, the character descriptions are still. Very correct. Like they describe Stephanie as five years old, dreams of being a ballerina, a sweet, happy little charmer who already knows how to use what she has to get what she wants. Oh, that's that's Aww. that's pretty accurate. That's, that's a pretty, very that's lovely stayed. description of a manipulative little child. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at this. Not yet. Not, not at yet. This stage. Not yet. Not at this stage. No, but I, you showed me that the other day, and um, big big thank you to your mom for oh. keeping everything. God bless Sherry Barber. Yeah, she kept yep. every little thing. Like it's just, and it it brings up so many feelings for me. Like in pencil, written here is like the page numbers that I have to turn to because that's where the lines were that I had to read during the audition. So page twelve and thirteen, page Aww. thirty-nine through forty-one. Those are the scenes I read for my audition for Jennifer, who turned into DJ. So, anyways, yep. fun little and facts. Can you for our imagine fans out there. you as D it, no, no, you were no. no. 
the, no. the show would have failed. Like it, I, I, it's I was true. always meant to be Kimmy Gibbler. Yes. Candace was always meant to be DJ. This it, is, I, it couldn't have happened any other way. I agree. I agree. But here's to the Crawfords, the family <laughs> that almost was, you know? They also weren't allowed to have wire hangers in their house, but um, that's... <laughs> I was... Yeah, sorry, okay. I, I'm, so, I'm sorry. It's Crawford. I was there. This, there. this is... Okay. This is... But the spirit of Bob Saget lives on through you oh. and your inappropriate humor, Jody. <laughs> Um, let's jump right in. We've gotten past these opening credits. We are now inside the house. We are in the Tanner living room. Danny enters the house with DJ and Stephanie and is trying to help his mother leave. Grandma says the baby is sleeping like a baby and then says, oh, my angels, and squats down while the while DJ and Stephanie go running into her arms. Tell, yes. Jody, tell me what you remember about this scene or your wardrobe, or your co-stars, or anything. What do you remember about this? So what I vividly remember is there's a part in this scene where, you know, Danny's um, trying to get his mom out the door. The girls don't want her to leave, so they keep kind of, like, doing this rotating hugging thing. They're hugging her. Danny moves them, and they go back. and So she goes out onto the front porch, and there's a moment where I grab Grandma, and I, I won't let her go. I'm, like, hugging her around her neck. And Danny picks up my legs and I'm like, he's, you know, holding like the back of me. And then I'm, my arms are wrapped around grandma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember that. So like, I, I remember that moment. That's such a great sight gag, by the way. It's so it's funny. Such a great, it's such a great mm -hmm. sight gag and was always such a wonderful moment because that, that was the, the thing that I remembered most about that first episode. And then also, you know, at the end of Fuller House, um, I walked back in the door and, and I think I, I hugged Bob. We Aww. all walked in. And so it was just kind of a neat, like full circle moment in that. Um, but yeah, I remember, you know, being like strung, you know, across the, the, uh, the d double wide doors, um, you know, hanging, just hanging around. And, um, yeah, it was, <laughs> I remember that moment, the little blue overalls, curly oh, hair. He was so cute. He's so cute. The curly hair. I was. The pink hair clips. The, yeah, yeah. The sponge rollers, the, the blue overalls. Did you get to pick out your wardrobe? Like how, do you remember if you had a, a say in your wardrobe or was it all kind of predetermined? I mean, it was kind of picked for me, mm -hmm. but I, and I was like, I didn't really, I was like, yeah, whatever. Like I didn't really, I wasn't really I, too picky about, you know, clothing or anything like that. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure, I know that you, that cl Kimmy Gibbler's clothes were, that's all. That's a, a oh, that's a whole a struggle. Other, that's a that's whole. A, we're not going to get into that yet. That's, but no, that's there's, a whole other. There's thing. time. We we got 191 more right. of these to go. Right. Uh, so we'll get to the Kimmy Gibbler clothing. Yes, but I later. do. I, I remember. I remember that moment, and I remember Grandma. You know, she leaves, and Danny saying like, "Okay, you know, we're going to have fun or what?" And it's just like, wah, wah, you know, yes. and crossing to the couch. And one thing that I noticed is that there were two couches. Yes. There and were two I couches. forgot there were two couches. Because later on, it's like two Ottomans, the, right? I think for a while, that later on was two chairs, mm -hmm. those two blue chairs. Right. But at first, it was the couch. And I think it became like such a pain to move in and out and like for shots and stuff and, you know, whatever. But it, it, I remember that like now I was like, that's right. There were two couches. I completely forgot about that. Where's the other couch? What happened? Who has the other couch? I, I bet John Stamos has both of them. <laughs> Right there, but yeah, it's got a backup, a backup couch. You gotta have a backup couch because it's yes. so, so iconic. <laughs> Hola, mi gente. This is Wilmer Valderrama, executive producer of the new podcast, De My Abuelita First, part of iHeartRadio's My Cultura Podcast Network. Each week, host Vico Ortiz and Abuelita Liliana Montenegro will play matchmaker for a group of hopeful romantics who are putting their trust in Abuelita to find them a date. Your job right now is to get on Abuelita's really good side. Our Abuelita definitely knows best. On Date My Abuelita first, three single contestants will vie for a date with one lucky main dater, except to get their heart, they have to win over Abuelita Liliana first. Oh, Hi, Liliana. Yes, we are ready for love. Through speed dating rounds, hilarious games, and Liliana's intuition, one contestant will either be a step closer to getting that pan dulce, if you know what I mean, or a step closer to getting that chancleta. Let's see if chispas will fly or if these singles will be sent back to the dating apps. Listen to Date My Abuelita first on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Hey, I'm Jay Shetty, and I'm the host of On Purpose. In this week's episode, I had the honor to interview President Joe Biden in his first ever personal interview about mental health. The president opens up about grief, connection, the childhood battles that have shaped him, personal mental health, and mental health at large. You don't want to miss it. The day will come when you open that closet door and you smell the fragrance of her dresses or you're walk, going by that park where you walked with your child or your, or your wife or your husband or the thing that reminds you. And for the longest time, it'll just bring a tear to your eye. But eventually, every once in a while, it'll bring a smile to your lips before it brings a tear to your eye. When that happens, you know you're going to make it. I mean, it doesn't mean you still don't cry. It doesn't mean the pain still isn't real even years later. But you know you can make it. Listen to On Purpose with Jay Shetty on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hola, I'm Alexia Napola. And I'm Marisol Patton. Your, your favorite, favorite Miami housewives. housewives. And now, the host of the new podcast, I Go Favor. Get ready because we are bringing the heat as we dish on hot topics, celeb gossip, and more. I'm so excited to, you know, bring our personal phone gossip that we've been doing for what, 23 years? Yes, now? we've been chimiando for 23 years and it's so much fun. And we hope that you guys are tuning in with us and are ready to laugh. Y si, tu sabes, aprender a little bit of Spanglish because this is who we are. This is what we do here. Mm -hmm. And by the end of you listening and tuning in with us, you'll be able to say, ay, por favor. And so your cockies run dry. We just can't wait for you guys to tune in. Yeah, and, and share all the achievement with us. Listen to I, por favor, as part of the Michael Dura Podcast Network, available on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Um. Okay, so Danny takes turns pulling the girls off of Grandma in a really funny sight gag, saying, uh, you know, Grandma really needs to go. And then Grandma says, Danny, I don't need to go back home. Danny tells her, Mom, this isn't how we rehearsed it last night. Take a walk with me. DJ and Stephanie follow them, but he shoots them a look as they run back to the door. Danny says she's been taking care of them for three months since Danny's wife, Pamela, died. And he doesn't know how they would have made it without her. But she really has to go because his dad needs her too. Now, this is a very, very emotional scene for the first scene straight out of the gate for a pilot. Like, I mean, you've got to set up the, the mom's dead. You know, you got to, I mean, it's got, you got just died three months ago. Like this is like a family. Well, it's got to be, yeah, it's got to be, it's got to be fresh enough that it requires the guys to move in, but not so fresh that everyone's just crying and it's uncomfortable to watch. So there's a window, I think, of time in sitcoms that is, um, you know, everyone's done grieving Right. And uh, and they've moved on relatively quickly. <laughs> it's there's definitely a balance, and I right. think that Jeff Franklin, who wrote the episode, struck it perfectly. Like for sure, just enough for sure. emotion, but not enough that we're well, all. Well, you just need to know that it's like a yeah, that it's a mo like it's a sad moment. Why are they so sad? The grandma's leaving. It's not like she comes every weekend. This was this was a big thing. Their life has changed. Life, um, yes, your lives are, have been turned upside down, and Grandma was there to help you. Yeah, uh, Danny says he's got everything under control, and help is moving in today. Grandma says, "If you need me, I'm on the next plane." He hugs her goodbye, and we think that she's about to leave, but then she squats down again and says, "My angels!" And the girls go running right back into her arms. Grandma eventually leaves, and Danny awkwardly says, "Okay, are we going to have fun or what?" The girls make adorable pouty faces before Danny asks to see some smiles and says that everything is going to work out super great. He reveals to the audience that Uncle Jesse is moving in and so is his best friend, Joey. That means Stephanie and DJ get the news that they are going to be roommates. He asks, isn't that exciting? And Stephanie says, I can wear all of DJ's clothes. But DJ is less enthused asking, do I have to share a room with her? Danny tries to convince her it'll be like having a slumber party, but she clarifies with only one guest who never leaves, which is perfectly delivered by Candace, who really, right? really nailed this like preteen moodiness. Oh, just, right. And now that I have two daughters, like they would. Yeah. They, like I get that. Like they had their own rooms and then you'd be like, now you're together. And they would have been like, I'm no, this isn't happening. Oh, yes. I felt this. I felt this moment where I was like, yeah, my kids, this would not fly with my kids Sh suddenly sharing a room at age 10. Right? No way would that go over. <laughs> yeah. I, poor DJ. I mean, you know, as a kid, like 
I didn't really, you know, now I look back at it, I'm like, oh man, DJ's really, yeah, just, you know, got to deal with the little sister. Mom's gone. Well, and she has that moment in the end. Mom, she does. Mom's oh, gone. Yes. Grandma left. I don't even have my own room. She moved into the garage. We'll, we'll, I, we'll get there. We'll get there. I feel for her. I definitely feel for her in this moment. Um, Uncle Jesse arrives. Hey, hey, look alive. Uncle Jesse is here. And he moves in carrying a small duffel, a bike helmet, and a guitar, not in a case. So you instantly know just from this like three second entrance exactly who Uncle Jesse is because he's just, he's a rock star. He looks the part, he plays the part. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something though. If he's riding a motorcycle with a guitar, not in a case, (laughs) it's fair. That's really, if you're a rock star, you are really treating your equipment pretty poorly. If you're not, there's not even a, not even a, a case, a soft case. Well, you know, you know, what happened? What if the guitar gets a, gravel in it or something i don't know i'm just saying i it, I, I i watched that and i was like did you just keep it on your back the whole time I, it was the 80s what do i know maybe, maybe he drove the motorcycle it. with one hand and was playing the guitar with the uh, this, this is just one of those sitcom things you this just one, right. you just have I, to look, just wave is, your hand i like, yeah, ask yeah. far too many logical questions sometimes for my own good. No, um, <laughs> you, you can't survive yeah, he, on a sitcom if you ask too many specific questions. That's like that. it's true. It's true. <laughs> you know what's funny though is the second you meet Uncle Jesse, I was like, I did not remember John's character being um, so harsh. He was very bold. Like he, he had was very like yeah, and bold I did energy walking into this scene. And I, I get that that's like the setup for the and and you know it's also who he kind of becomes in uh, as a member of the family and all this stuff. So I mean. Really, Uncle Jesse goes on quite a journey starting where he does. But yeah, I just remembered he came in and I remember he, Bob and John at first did not, like John was not here for Bob's fooling around. And Bob was like, John's taking this way too seriously. And they like, they did not get along. At okay, first, I remember is, this rumor. This is a rumor. So this is true. That John oh, and Bob absolutely true. They, yeah, did not they, get along at first. They've talked about it um, that they did not um, that they did not get along the, like uh, at first, and they couldn't stand each other, and they annoyed each other, and blah 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 blah. And I remember sort of the like the tension. It was like you know, because it was. I just remember like John coming f- also from like soap opera world too. So it was mm. shooting twenty some odd pages a day. Like you, you know what I mean. Like you've got to get the work done. And Bob's right. a, you know stand up, and and he was like, let's just have fun and goof around, and you know. So I think those two working styles really came into conflict in the beginning. Um, but then, you know, by by the end, they were literal brothers mm-hmm. and absolutely loved each other. But it was, yeah, it did not did not start off that way. And it it's a, a testament to to Bob and John, really, uh, that they created such a dynamic, close relationship over the years. Mm. I love that. I'm glad. I'm glad they worked it out because yeah, because again, it could have. It. I mean, it could have gone sideways. The Crawfords, Bob and John could have hated each other. Right. It could. It all. It's so many moments. This could have gone really sideways. So yeah. I'm glad yep. they they found some common ground. Yes. Yes. Um, Danny asks Jesse where he was because he missed breakfast, and he tells Danny that after his gig at the Smash Club, our first mention of the Smash Club, oh, the Smash Club before Jesse owned it though. Yes. When he yes. was just playing there. Prior to Jesse owning it, uh, Jesse took a ride on his Harley and ended up in Reno. He happened to wander into this show called Razzle Dazzle 87, which was much better than Razzle Dazzle 86, by the way, where he locked <laughs> eyes with an incredible showgirl named Vanessa. Danny starts to get nervous about where this story is going as he notices the girls are taking in every word Uncle Jesse says and stops him in front of the girls right before he gets a little too descriptive about what Vanessa was starving for. Now, this was a little racy, right? Like, this is like, it, yeah, the Full well, House, the family comedy. I was just like, oh, well, we got Full the House, windows already. Full House, the family comedy was almost not. Full House originally was a story about three comics. That's right. House of Jeff, Comics. Originally, House, House of Comics. And really, the show that Jeff wrote was about these three guys. And I think the kids may have been in it, mm. but not as significantly as you know wound up being a family sitcom but that the 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 sort of general direction i think of what jeff had originally envisioned before it became full house 
was more of a like a, a buddy comedy between these three guys and sort of their dating life and single dads and you know dealing with kids and whatever but that was i think kind of more of the more of the 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 vibe of it um and so you, i think we see, still see like a little bit of some of those holdovers in um in in some of the characters especially in the first episode and the first couple episodes i think i'm so eager to get jeff on the show and ask him these questions about right the origin story of the show. And yeah, because I remember I I remember him talking about how he changed the entire idea of the show from House of Comics during the pitch meeting, I believe. Right, because they were like, like well, what do you have more that's family? And he was like, I've got this. And he just <laughs> made it into, yeah. yeah. He just created it on the spot, which is funny because right. Jeff is, like, he's never been married. He doesn't have any kids. Like, He's not really a family Which guy. That's why he wrote a show about three stand-up comedians and not family, right? right. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll try it. But, but um, he had to pivot very quickly yep, and yep. created one of the most iconic family shows of all time. True. Uh, speaking of pivoting, my ballet skills really come <laughs> to the forefront of this yes. scene because uh, I apparently all Steph wants to do is just play ballerina. You were very um, persistent. It was very, very persistent. persistent. Stephanie wants to play ballerina with Uncle Jesse, but he says he doesn't want to play. But she nags him and eventually guilts him into it with her sad face, which was an excellent sad face of rubbing your eyes like you were tired. I, I couldn't. Right. I was either just really tired. I, I had an allergy attack, <laughs> something a metal shard in my eye, or um, I was uh, feigning uh, crying. <laughs> you, well, the couch was very dusty. I mean, at least in Fuller House. Oh, God, so it was, maybe yeah, yeah. it was the dust from one of the two plaid couches. It, pro- it was. I had severe allergies as a child. That's what it was. Um, but I also, that's what I do when I throw a fit. You've seen it before, Andrea. I do it all the time. No, I don't <laughs> want to record the podcast. Right. And that's what it I works do. well. It works. It's very effective. It's never failed uh, up until now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jesse and Stephanie play ballerina. Uh, or he asks how they play ballerina and she says they dance and then she instructs him on how to twirl on his tiptoes before telling him he needs to practice because they're going to do this every single day. Jesse is not impressed. Obviously, now, he doesn't want to be a professional dancer because that's what it takes. It uh, takes every day. Were you into ballet as a child? Oh, yeah, I was. A, yes, I was a big dancer. That was part of the oh, reason so why they was written for you. Yeah, I loved dancing. That was like how I kind of got into performing really was dance recitals and um, I, I loved being up on stage and doing all that. So, yeah, they, they really wrote some of the parts of Steph uh, um, around things that were actually true of me. So it was it was great because I got to, you know, I mean, obviously, my ballet skills were top notch. So oh, they were so yeah, cute. They were. Well, I was I was I was a member of the young Joffrey Ballet at that point, <laughs> um, evidenced by my tiptoeing around the living room. It was so cute. You had it was great really skills cute. for a five year old. I mean, it was fantastic. I was I was cute. I wouldn't have said no to me playing ballerina. <laughs> well, but we had to establish that Jesse was not exactly, you know, super fond of kids. Of course, this was a learning course. experience for him. Uh, next, we have Joey, who arrives completely covered by a huge pile of clothes and doing a signature Dave trumpet horn sound. <laughs> oh, that was good. I was debating if I should try to recreate it. And I was like, no, that would not be I good. I have never it. really even tried to do that before. And I just went for it. In the moment, yeah. I was like, try it. What's the worst that could happen? And you nailed it. <laughs> Now I'm not going to, now, now, it's, now it's, it's diminishing return. Now it's getting weird. Okay, no, Dave okay. would be very proud of you. Um, Danny takes the clothes from Joey, revealing that Joey is wearing a very loud cartoon button-down shirt. And this is, like, this is so Joey Gladstone. Like, you just instantly know he is just, like, one big kid. It was, it was like, they weren't, they weren't Hawaiian shirts, necessarily. They were just loud they were very loud and kid-like yeah and you're just like okay i can't take this guy seriously because he's wearing this loud not hawaiian but hawaiian-esque wonder, cartoon I, shirt were those w- was that a thing i don't was i mean obviously they were readily available at stores were people walking around wearing these sorts of of shirts Maybe not in public, no. Okay, okay. I just, I wasn't sure. I don't remember even what was on the shirts particularly. I tried to look on, like, when as I was watching the show, what was on there, but I couldn't tell. Was it Popeye? 
It's hard to tell. No, I couldn't I think, quite make it out either. I just, okay. you could instantly know I this is a, a Joey Popeye Gladstone shirt. shirt. Got it. Sure he did. Okay. I'm sure it was in his his pile of dirty clothes that he was carrying. <laughs> right. And nothing says I've chosen the right person to help me look after my children than someone who can't do laundry and is living in an alcove. Right. That's, you know, I, that's, yeah. <laughs> right. And, and Joey says, he says, and oh. someone who doesn't even keep their guitar in a case. You know what I mean? Right. These are not the people. That, <laughs> these aren't the most <laughs> reliable people that Danny has chosen, <laughs> but that's, that's, but that's part okay. of the gag. That's part of the joke. The joke has to work. The joke has to work. Uh, right. So Joey comments, wow, you know, I'm so lucky. I'm moving into a new place on the exact day that I run out of clean clothes. And that's wonderful. And then you get this great shot of Bob who quickly drops all of the clothes on the floor and everyone right. slowly backs away from the clothes. Fantastic. I'm not totally clear at this point if Jesse and Joey have moved in as a favor to Danny or if they're just there for the free rent. I mean, isn't sort of one shaking the hand with the other you know what i mean like i mean sure i'll do this favor for you but i'm also like getting free rent so it's kind of working out for both of us you, you know scratch I mean? my back i'll scratch yeah. yours is it one of those yeah, situations it's a, yeah i think that's i mean it sounds you know and then and then then they got trapped and they never left and they <laughs> for eight years for eight years 36, right yes <laughs> right i mean who'd want to move out of an alcove you know the alcove. The alcove was a very attractive option for Joey. I had never heard, I think, until I was a kid, the word alcove until that show, until Full House, like as a kid. And then I like I just had this idea in my head that all San Francisco homes had what was apparently a standard feature of an alcove. I wonder if this is a San Francisco thing. This is not. I don't San... remember homes having There's alcoves no... in the eighties. Do you remember the Full House house when we actually went in it? Fit an alcove in there. Where are you going to fit an alcove? <laughs> the alcove's no room bigger for than alcove. the whole first floor. <laughs> There's no. No one's having alcoves in most of these San Francisco skinny houses. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'd never heard of an alcove. The alcove is is apparently it's like a little uh, half cave um, in under the stairs. Yeah. Sort of. I have an alcove in my house now. You do? Yeah. You know, that but, little under it, my house, you know, the little under stair, like, oh, yeah, like the little Harry Potter room. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. But it's not, okay. I don't think Joey could live there. So Full House made alcoves popular. It did. Maybe. It did. It really, it revitalized the alcove industry. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so Joey moves into the large alcove in the back of the living room and says that there is no way all of his stuff is going to fit in this room. Danny corrects him and says this isn't a tiny room. It's a large alcove and that he will be, he will be living in it for free. Suddenly, Joey says this room is enormous. Then Joey tells the girls that they are going to have so much fun together before doing a lot of signature Dave Coulier sound effects, including Popeye and a laser. DJ. A laser. That's right. He was. Yeah. This, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. DJ asks Danny if he thinks, is there any chance they could still catch grandma at the airport, which is a great button to this entire scene, which right. is a very, very long scene for the cold open of the pilot. Like this scene just goes on. Forever. Well, there was a lot. It goes on only half the length of the opening credits, though. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> it is. a. It's a very long scene. Um but you got but, a lot of like, things to establish. There's a lot of exposition that needs to happen. I right. mean, there's, you know, you can't the 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 nuance in a in a 30 minute sitcom is is minimal. So you've got to explain mom's gone, mm -hmm. dad needs help, grandma's, grandma's leaving, gone. kids are unhappy, um Jesse's uh, a rock star and Joey's an idiot. Well, not an idiot, but like a well, just a mess. You know what I mean? Same thing. So it takes it takes a fair amount of of pages to to cover all of those six or seven very important topics. And can we talk for a minute? Because I'm betting that there are hundreds of people out there that have seen this episode or all of Full House and still don't kind of understand the relation, like who these people are, like the relationships. So I don't Jesse think that, is, I don't think very often that the writers sometimes <laughs> did. Or, you know what I mean? Because we kind of went, oh, that's right. <laughs> We're actually all related. So Jesse, Uncle Jesse is your uncle, He, but he's not related to Danny Tanner. No, he's Pamela's, Pamela's brother. Brother. That's right. Right. So he's the in-law. He's Danny's in brother-in-law. He's Danny's, he's Danny's brother-in-law who starts off the show not Greek with the right. last name of Cochran. Cochran. Which gets um, changed very quickly. Which gets changed pretty quickly. And we'll, we'll cover that. But... Mm -hmm. um. 
but yeah, he starts off as as Cochran, then becomes Greeker, um, even though Steph and DJ and Michelle are look nothing no. like that side of the family because we've also met like we at some point we meet the the other Greek family and uh, okay. yeah apparently Pam maybe Pam was adopted maybe Pam was you know let's go with that let's go with that because I it yeah I've seen some of the parents and it just it's a strange it's, a, it's an interesting matchup there you know yeah. what I mean well but anyway but that's how technically the the family tree is drawn okay so Jesse is Danny's brother in law and Joey even though. People commonly call him Uncle Joey. He's not, in fact, an uncle. He is not an uncle, nor has... I'm going to debate this fact. Because people always say, oh, what about Uncle Joey? I'm like, and I'm the first to... I'm like, actually. (laughs) Wait a minute. Actually, he was. he's not an uncle. And we never called him Uncle Joey. Right. Even more importantly, yes. But they did on Fuller. (gasps) The younger kids, I think, started calling him Uncle Joey. Because I remember having this 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 discussion, I think, in notes and being like, but he's not an uncle. He's right. not a, we never call him Uncle Joey. Maybe yeah. it's one of those, you know, sort of by association, he's become an uncle over time. I'm not right. saying he can't be. Well, I'm not saying I, I am opposed to his membership as an honorary uncle. I'm just saying I don't think we ever called him Uncle Joey. I agree. I agree. This is a sticking point see it for me as well. In our rewatch, if we see it happen and there's some mention of Uncle Joey, but if we get to all 192 episodes and he has not been called Uncle Joey, I'm going to feel vindicated. Absolutely. Well, yeah. we've got a long ways to go <laughs> until we get to that moment, but I oh, look forward. It's going to be. A, I'm going to have to wait to a while. That moment. <laughs> Hola, mi gente. This is Wilmer Valderrama, executive producer of the new podcast, De My Abuelita First, part of iHeartRadio's My Cultura Podcast Network. Each week, host Vico Ortiz and Abuelita Liliana Montenegro will play matchmaker for a group of hopeful romantics who are putting their trust in Abuelita to find them a date. Your job right now is to get on Abuelita's really good side. Our Abuelita definitely knows best. On Date My Abuelita First, three single contestants will vie for a date with one lucky main dater, Except to get their heart, they have to win over Abuelita Liliana first. Oh, Hi, Liliana. Yes, we are ready for love. Through speed dating rounds, hilarious games, and Liliana's intuition, one contestant will either be a step closer to getting that pan dulce, if you know what I mean, or a step closer to getting that chancleta. Let's see if chispas will fly or if these singles will be sent back to the dating apps. Listen to Date My Abuelita first on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, I'm Jay Shetty, and I'm the host of On Purpose. In this week's episode, I had the honor to interview President Joe Biden in his first ever personal interview about mental health. The president opens up about grief, connection, the childhood battles that have shaped him, personal mental health, and mental health at large. You don't want to miss it. The day will come when you open that closet door and you smell the fragrance of her dresses or you're walk, going by that park where you walked with your child or your, or your wife or your husband or the thing that reminds you. And for the longest time, it'll just bring a tear to your eye. But eventually, every once in a while, it'll bring a smile to your lips before it brings a tear to your eye. When that happens, you know you're going to make it. I mean, it doesn't mean you still don't cry. It doesn't mean the pain still isn't real, even years later. But you know you can make it. Listen to On Purpose with Jay Shetty on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hola, I'm Alexia Napola. And I'm Marisol Patton. Your your favorite favorite Miami Miami housewives. housewives. And now, the host of the new podcast, I Por Favor. Get ready because we are bringing the heat as we dish on hot topics, celeb gossip, and more. I'm so excited to, you know, bring our personal phone gossip that we've been doing for, what, 23 years? Yes, now? we've been chimiando for 23 years, and it's so much fun, and we hope that you guys are tuning in with us and are ready to laugh. Y si, tu sabe, aprender a little bit of Spanglish, because this is who we are, this is what we do here, mm-hmm. and by the end of you listening and tuning in with us, you'll be able to say, ay, por favor, until your cockies run dry. We just can't wait for you guys to tune in. Yeah, and and share all the achievement with us. Listen to Ay Por Favor as part of the Michael Dura Podcast Network, available on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Um, okay, so the next scene, we have finally finished the cold open and we are now upstairs in Uncle Jess, what is now Uncle Jesse's room. Danny and Jesse walk into the room. This is formerly Stephanie's room. So yes. it is, the room is baby blue. It is covered in pink bunnies. There is tiny furniture and ballet slippers on the wall. Yep. Jesse says, oh, Barbie's dream house would look great near the window. Right. Which is in that original script, by the way. Remember, we were looking at it the other yes. day and I said that line is in the original show. That joke stayed. Um, right. Through all the name changes, that joke stayed. That joke stayed. That joke worked. Um, but the pink bunnies are actually a very important story. Oh, they that I are? don't think are necessarily discussed in this episode. I think it comes a little bit later. Oh, maybe. Okay. Um, but the pink bunnies were apparently hand cut out by Steph's mom, by Pamela, and oh. put in her room. Oh, I did so not. I didn't watch that the, episode. That okay. was the um, that was the story of the pink bunnies. So that's why they left the pink bunnies. Up. That was why they left the pink bunnies up. Right. Oh, that's right. well. Jesse's not a fan. Unfortunately, he he's not sentimental well, yeah. at this. Point. And then eventually, he gave a framed one to Michelle. They weren't even her pink bunnies. What? That, that wasn't even her room. room. Oh. Anyway, we'll get there. We'll get there. I've got a, I've some, got pages we, on that. Are we resentful of that, Jody Sweeten? Are we okay? You've got pages. <laughs> no, you've got notes. Got on pages. That. Okay. <laughs> we'll um, but that yeah, when we that get there. was that was the story of the pink bunnies. So that was why they were there. But no, Jesse was not exactly feeling the vibe of pink bunnies and ballet. No, oh, he's very anti-kid in this whole episode, which we'll get to that. Okay. Jesse starts to unpack his two things on hangers while Danny gets emotional, saying how much he appreciates him being there. Danny tells him the girls are so happy to have him here. Danny hugs Jesse tightly and says, God bless you. And Jesse says, you are hugging me in a room with pink bunnies. Which, the, well, I mean, that's, well, there's one of those jokes that you yeah. go, oh, there's the not so thinly veiled sort of homophobic jokes of the 80s but you know i it's, yeah. i think it's i think it, I, I it was also more that like jesse was just not emotional and danny was emotional and that was i think you know the hugging thing right this um, joke bumped me too i'm like oh yeah that's not like men being uncomfortable with hugging other men that's not funny anymore so this this joke did right. not hold up i mean um, I, it was yeah it was i really i feel like jesse uh he's got a lot he's got some emotional growing to do some work you know I'd like to see him uh, really discuss some of these feelings about why he's so, you know, averse to being hugged in a well, room with a, pink bunnies. He's a tough guy. He's very much <laughs> into proving how tough of a guy that he is. Right. With his three shirts. <laughs> right. Um, so Danny breaks away from the hug and says, you know, sorry, I am just a lean, mean, hugging machine. Now, I want to talk about this hugging bit for a bit because wasn't... This originally written because there, okay, Bob Saget wasn't the original Tanny, Danny Tanner either. No, no, he was not the original Danny Tanner. John Posey was the original Danny Tanner, and we shot a pilot episode with John Posey, which uh, it, it, I think people can, it's out there somewhere on, you know, YouTube or whatever. Um, and it's, I think it's in like some of the extended DVD cuts. Um, but yeah, Bob was not the original Danny Tanner. It was John Posey. Uh, Bob was doing another show. And then through, again, a series of things that happened and unfolded and Bob got fired or not fired, but was no longer on the morning show that he was doing. So his schedule opened up. But the only reason that they knew about it was because Dave and Bob had like lived together when they were young and they had were still friends. And so when Dave heard that Bob was available, he told Jeff or something like it was some sort of like random again happening of how we all wound up in the right place at the right time and we actually went and reshot the pilot with Bob. Oh wow. Hugging. Wow. Yeah. Do you remember shooting scenes with John Posey? I I remember like the first scene. I think just because that first scene was so memorable and iconic for me as like a kid and an actor and a, you know. Um I remember shooting it with John Posey. Um but yeah, I don't, I mean, I, 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 he was just there for one episode. Lovely man, very yeah, sweet, yeah. very, it wasn't ever like a, you know, personality thing. It just, right. he, Bob, I think was who Jeff had always wanted and it just was a scheduling thing. And then when it kind of resolved itself, it, Bob, Bob came in and, and he was Danny Tanner with his wonderful hugs. So I feel like this joke is kind of a holdover from when Posey was in the pilot because Posey was more of like a teddy bear build, like he was like a huggable shorter 
huggable guy. And, you know, he wasn't this tall, long, green. Are you saying only short people are huggable, Andrea? Is that what you're saying? Are you? (laughs) I'm just saying. I have a lot of emails about that. I feel like this, it's a person, if if hugging is going to be a personality trait, you know, you have to look huggable. And I feel like maybe John Posey looked more huggable and that's why that was written in and it, it just carried over. When Bob became Danny Tanner, now Danny, no, I don't. Is that I, just I don't my own? I, don't, I think that's just your own. I mean, you can you can build that story it's, out if you'd like. That that's if, the story that, I've it was that John looked more hug. So basically, the story is John was more huggable. That's what you've told yourself. That's what I've told. That that's was more that's the origin of the hugging hugging personality. You know what? Thing. I I don't know the actual origin because I am not Jeff Franklin, so he he would know that. But I think it was. I, I mean, I remember John Posey being that. I, I I seem to remember it being just that that was kind of the juxtaposition between like Jesse and Joey and Danny was that Danny was the emotional hugger family guy. Jesse was the like rock and roll bro, and then you know Joey was just kind of this loony, almost childlike person himself. So I think it was that was part of who Danny Tanner was. But if you okay. want to make it that um, that you know uh, John Posey was more huggable, I mean we can tell that story too if you'd like. Well, every everybody, <laughs> so everyone, email us and give us your opinions. Like tell us what <laughs> right. you think. Was Bob Saget? He was a very huggable guy, but I'm, you know, he was very tall. Too. I, I, I think it was just part of the the character. But we can, you know, again, we could choose your own adventure. We can create whatever we want. And when Jeff Franklin is on the show, we will absolutely we will ask, ask him. him this question, and that was will put all of these rumors. To John rest. Posey more huggable than Bob? Is that on the record? <laughs> That's the <Go>. debate, <laughs> right? That's the question. <laughs> So finally, we see Jesse get more emotional. He says, you know, Pam was my big sister. He loved her very much. And he loved he loves the kids. He is happy to do whatever Danny needs him to do, which is a great moment. Was this I I thought I wrote it down. No, it was at the end where we hear the first strings of the violin. Oh, that comes later. I don't think That's, there were violins. I don't think they were there. Point. No, but it was a definitely a more quiet moment. But I but the 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 first strings of the violin are played at the end of this episode. Oh yes, I can't wait for that. I can't wait. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Danny once again gets emotional and hugs him again, and Jesse says he's gonna need to regulate this hugging. So again, this joke, yeah, this these jokes. We're supposed to be funny at the time. They're supposed to know. be funny at the time. Now it's not funny. But I'm also, I'll try and give benefit of the doubt here. Celia, my best friend, does not like to be hugged. Oh, okay. In a room of pink bunnies or otherwise. She's just not a big hugger. So I respect that. Maybe, maybe, Jesse, it's not so much the, it's, you know, that not that he's um, problematic in that regard, uh, but that, you know, maybe he just is not, uh, maybe he's just a little, he's a little overstimulated, doesn't really want to be hugged at that moment. I fully respect that. That's probably not true. It was probably, I'm going to, I'm going to go with that, but that's probably not true. It was definitely um, veiled inappropriate um, sort of (laughs) jokes in the eighties, but we all need to respect each other's boundaries and wishes, you know? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Okay. Next scene. We are finally in DJ and Stephanie's room, which is such a cool room there is like bangles posters on the wall yeah there is a giant's pendant so you know exactly where you are we're in san francisco right i just thought this was the coolest room ever the red dj's red uh metal bed metal and bed. The, like yes. the geometric uh wallpaper and, and the matching bedspread and pillows they were yes. fantastic with her pillow person Oh yeah, There's the pillow this person. Is the first time we see the pillow. First time we person see the pillow too. person, and I have to say, I'm holding like a stuffed dog, mm-hmm. a stuffed golden retriever, by the way, but a stuffed dog in the scene. Mister Bear is nowhere to be found. No, but this this is pre Mister Bear yeah, but era. Speaking of, this is that's the original Mister Bear sitting right here behind me. Um, it, it, that. Is Aww. in the background of my shot, but that's the original Mr. Bear. Um, but yeah, he was not in the pilot. I was a little, um, I was shocked actually. So, do you think the little the little dog you were carrying was supposed to be like a little a little I miniature think comet? Was, but comet, we didn't have comet yet. Oh, you didn't have comet yet. Yeah, we didn't have comet yet. This is foreshadowing. It's foreshadowing for okay. sure. <laughs> yeah. So DJ starts to lay down some roommate ground rules while pulling a streamer down the middle of the room to divide it in half. Rule yep. number one, don't touch my stuff. Rule number two, don't set foot on my side of the room. And since the door to the room is on DJ's side, Stephanie wants to know how she'll ever get out. And DJ says, it's easy. Jump out the window and climb down the tree. 
Stephanie doesn't want to do that. So she says she will find another way out and then starts to climb on the curtains. Oh, boy. And here's where we run into (laughs) one of the first things that you can no longer do with television or with children (laughs) on television, which is suspend them more than six inches off the ground uh, in a stunt harness. (laughs) But this is one of the most iconic moments in the entire episode. And I am so excited to hear exactly how you did Mm. this stunt. Like, it it doesn't look exactly natural, I would say. But Uh, tell me how they did this. So... It was, there basically was like a, it was sort of like a rock climbing harness, right? Okay. With wires attached to either side. Um, So it was almost like a really uncomfortable looking bathing suit bottom that was like, you know those those swings at the park for oh, babies yeah. yes. that are like the plastic hard things and you just stick their little legs in? It has holes Imagine for legs. Imagine wearing yeah. that, oh, like boy. under your clothes. <laughs> It's so comfortable, doesn't pinch, you know, not at all restricting. (laughs) Um, Anyway, so, and of course, they don't exactly make these, like, for kid sizes, you know what I mean? They're not, there's, so they have to kind of adjust it and do, it was a whole, like, fittings with meetings with the stunt people and all this stuff. And, you know, this is my first, like, big, I mean, I'd done one episode of television before, so I was like, I didn't know how any of this worked, so I was like, okay. And I loved it. I was always up for, yeah. I was a kid that was always up for like some silly, crazy adventure. Um, I will say though, it was a little uncomfortable. Definitely pinched certain places when you're hanging in the thing and being supported. Um, And one thing that you see as I'm so believably crawling across the, um, the curtains hand over hand is that the curtains are just slapping me in the face, right? Like, they're just, I can't see. I'm like, (laughs) if you look at my face in the thing, it's hilarious. Because obviously, I'm like, but I'm, my eyes are closed. You know what I mean? I'm like, how this child is climbing across the curtains with her eyes closed and curtains smacking her in the face. And it was dusty because everything's dusty on a set. Everything is dusty. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. And then I, I, so I got to ride it all the way over and then, DJ pulls the curtains and I got to like ride it all the way back, thus also getting slapped in the face the reverse direction with said curtains, um, but making for a really, really funny and iconic joke. And I mean, the best joke of the whole thing was they walk in, you know, Danny says, Steph, what are you doing? Oh, just hanging around. Yes. That's one of my favorite lines in the just whole episode. Around. It yeah. was so that your delivery was so perfect on that line and so cute and just one of my Thank favorite you. moments in the whole Thank episode. You. Well, we we start s- soon seeing that uh, that Steph is a little bit of a kind of a, a snarky smartass, um, <laughs> which I love. But which? yeah, the curtain scene is that is I I vividly I vividly remember that. Um, oh. it, you know, I mean, how often do you get hung from curtains as a child? <laughs> Uh, okay, so Danny gets Stephanie down and Joey comes in singing and acting like he's going to do the limbo dance under the room divider. It's too low and right. he can't do it. Do you remember Dave used to like just make that noise and sing that weird song all the yes, time? Yes, that jogged a memory for me. Yes. That, yeah, me too. That I was, was like, a Dave oh, creation, yeah. I'm sure. It was just like a weird, it was again one of those Andrea Barber. It was right. just like you'd he'd walk in the room just like shimmying his shoulders. He's like, like a book. And you just da, 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 da. and then you were like, okay, now we're done. Yeah, that was not just so Joey weird. Gladstone. That was Dave being that was Dave. Dave. Absolutely. That was Dave. Yep. <laughs> DJ says sharing a room with Stephanie is already a nightmare. And Danny tell, tells her that everything is going to work out super great. Danny has to leave to go to work at the station where he's doing a two-part sports report on boxers. Highly skilled athletes or bullies in shorts. This is the first time we learn that Danny is a sports TV reporter. Which, in the original early pilot script I have, he was a weatherman. So that that changed. Uh, Stephanie asks for a piggyback ride, and Danny picks her up. Yep. Danny tells Jesse and Joey that the baby's schedule is on the fridge, and he he wants to make sure, can the guys handle this? The guys answer that they definitely got this, and Danny starts to leave. Stephanie looks back at DJ and says, I, I told you, you I'd find a way out. <laughs> and DJ looks <laughs> miserable. Yep. Uh, speaking of DJ's suggestion of climbing out the window... There's an extra window in that set. Or maybe I'm just remembering the fuller one, but there is a window next to Steph's bed. And I think at some point that 
went away. Oh. And it was just the window seat. But it, I, it went oh, away I'm in fuller? Keep, okay. In full house, I thought. In but full- I could be, again, I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm going to keep watching the set because I think we did at some, we moved sets and I think changed a couple little things, but. I so we, well, we already know that the backyard is a shape shifting set. So maybe the bedroom right. was also somewhat shape shifting as well. It was all they were all shape. The entire house was shape shifting. <laughs> it was a Harry Potter spell for sure to fit everyone in that house. It was an optical illusion. Yes, yes. Well, you know that the pilot is such a major iconic episode that we're gonna have to split this into two different recaps. So let's wrap up this part one of the pilot and make sure that you tune in next time where we will discuss the second half of the pilot on How Rude Tanneritos. And don't forget to follow us and DM us on Instagram at How Rude Podcast. Hey, I'm Jay Shetty, and I'm the host of On Purpose. In this week's episode, I had the honor to interview President Joe Biden in his first ever personal interview about mental health. We have an enormous opportunity, but the thing I want to change is American attitude. We can do anything. There's nothing we've ever set our mind to we've not been able to do we've done together. For real. Listen to On Purpose with Jay Shetty on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, I'm Wilmer Valderrama, executive producer of the new podcast, De My Abuelita First. Each week, the incredible Vico Ortiz and fabulous abuelita Liliana Montenegro will play matchmaker for a group of hopeful romantics. Right, Vico? You know it. Listen to De My Abuelita First, Thursdays on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't do anything I wouldn't do. Just do it better. Besitos. The podcast, Transportista, Who Murdered Captain Coral, tells the story of Colombia's drug wars. Pablo Escobar's death was supposed to bring peace to Medellin, but that peace was shattered for Beto Coral when his father was murdered. Two sides, criminals and law enforcement, in a battle to the death. In the middle, a city full of innocent people. The result? Thousands of forgotten victims. Listen to Transportista, Who Murdered Captain Coral, on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.